Hey everyone, welcome back. And this is the final video in our DP700 exam preparation course. Today, we've got a very, very special and important one because we're gonna be looking at exam technique, tips, tricks, strategies, or as I would like to call it, don't lose 10 to 20% of the marks through poor exam technique. Because unfortunately, this is a common story, especially for people that have never taken a Microsoft exam before. They're not sure what to expect. They go into the exam. They might be technically quite good, but unfortunately, because they're not very good at managing their time or understanding how the exam works, they can lose up to 10 or sometimes 20% of their score because they don't get all the way through the exam. So let's make sure that none of you fall for these mistakes and you have a good exam technique going into the DP700 exam to maximize your chances of passing. So in this video, we're going to be looking at booking the exam, preparing for the exam, what to do when you're actually in the exam, and then after the exam. Let's get going. So booking the exam. Now, you should always book Microsoft exams, certification exams with your personal email address so that if you leave your current company in the future, you have all of your exam certificates underneath your personal email address and you can move between companies and those certifications follow you as you go. Now, it's not the end of the world. If you do it on your company account, you can get in touch with Microsoft and they can transfer them for you, but it's just better to try and do it on your personal email address. At the time of recording, there are currently still some exam vouchers for 50% off, right? You've still got a few days left until the end of March to take advantage of that offer. So if you haven't booked your exam yet and there is an available voucher, then you might as well use it because you'll save 50% off the cost of the exam. To eliminate a lot of stress, I always recommend taking the exam in person, if you can. I recognize that not everyone lives near one of the exam test centers, but if you do, or a commutable distance to one of the centers, I strongly recommend that you do the exam in person. It takes away a lot of the stress. You just turn up, you take your exam, you go home. Unfortunately, if you take the exam from home, then there are a few things that you need to be aware of. You need to install some not so great software onto your machine, and that can be buggy and it can crash. There's many, many reports from the DP600 saying the exam crashed and then they had to retake the exam at a later date. This software basically takes over your whole machine and some machines don't like that. So it basically makes it very tricky to use. And in the worst case, it means that you can't complete your exam. You also have to clear your desk you have to remove any extra or more than one external monitors that you might have. You have to clear the area in front of your desk and to the left and to the right and behind your desk. Just takes a lot of time to prepare that. And there's many, many other painful stories. So that's why I would argue if you can take it in person. Again, I appreciate not everyone has that choice. So talking about preparing for the exam, how do we prepare for the exam and how do we know when we're ready? Well, you should go back through this course, of course. Review everything again. Make sure you understand it deeply. Any areas that you don't understand, make sure you go into the documentation and review that as your first port of call. Then look at other people creating content around the DP700 or people generally creating content on the topics that you need a bit more context on. The DP700 requires you to have hands-on experience. Some of the previous Microsoft exams, you know, it's more conceptual. You don't really need hands-on experience. With this one, you definitely do. So if you're a member of the Fabric Dojo, that's basically why I created Fabric Dojo, is to help people get these hands-on experience. You also have the benefit of the study notes. So read through those again. Do all of the hands-on tutorials. We've got about 60 that align to the DP700 study guide. Rewatch. We did whole other sessions around the bootcamp. So rewatch those. Read all of the discussions on exam topics. Now for everyone, you should be very familiar with the documentation as this is available to you during the exam. And we'll be talking about specific strategies for how and when to look at the documentation a little bit later on. So I mentioned a few other creators and resources that I recommend. Firstly is the Reactor. So if you've got one of the vouchers, you might have had to watch some of these series to get your voucher. There's a lot, a lot of videos here from a variety of different MVPs and community content creators and that sorts of things. So have a look at those. Also check out PortQBI with Valerie Young and a writer who has a blog. I think it's sqlwriter.com. And they're kind of pairing up to provide DP700 related content as well. So check that out. Alexi Partanan also has a series going on for DP700. 
So you can check out his videos. And also Abu Bakr Alwi, he also has a newsletter on LinkedIn, the data guy ISB. And you know, that's a very good summary of a lot of the modules for the DP700 exam. So there's a wide variety of different sources that you can pick and choose and just hear other people's perspectives, hear other people explain things in different ways, right? Which is really beneficial because you can then triangulate that knowledge. So what about when you're in the exam? What strategies should you employ to try and optimize your score? So let's just talk about the exam first. You get given 100 minutes to actually answer questions. Now there's gonna be around 55 questions, but it'll be between 52 and probably 58 varies for each person. Within that 55 questions, you'll receive one case study. And the case study is essentially eight to 10 questions all around one specific scenario, okay? So you get given quite a detailed scenario about a company and what they're trying to do, what their requirements are, what their initial state is, you know, what tools they're using and what their goals are as a business. And you answer questions to try and help them make decisions about their architecture or their solutions that they're gonna build. Now, normally you'd only get one case study. I think in some of the beta exams, they give you two case studies, but you should prepare for just one case study. And the case study will either be right at the very beginning of the exam or right at the very end of the exam. And depending on whether the case study is at the beginning or the end of the exam makes a bit of a difference as to your exam technique. We'll be looking at that in more detail in the next slide. If you've never taken a Microsoft exam before, I recommend you check out the exam sandbox. You can Google Microsoft exam sandbox and it gives you an idea of the UI that you're gonna be using and the question types, okay? So there's a variety of different question types that you can expect. So make sure you're familiar with those so that you understand how they work if this is your first Microsoft exam. You'll have access to Microsoft Learn during the exam, but you have to be very careful with this because you know, again, this is one of the key areas where people mess up. Only recently, I think a year, maybe two years ago now, they started letting you use Microsoft Learn during the exam and some people really abuse that, right? They go in there, they get into rabbit holes, searching for things for 10 minutes, on one question and then they run out of time and they realize you know they've still got five or ten questions left unanswered so that's really what you don't want to be doing okay so let me talk you through my highly opinionated exam technique strategy and i've broken this down into two options really whether you get the case study at the start or the case study at the end so let's start with the case study at the start now obviously you have this hundred minutes and you need to break up that 100 minutes or subdivide that 100 minutes, at least in your head, into some buckets, right, that make sense. Now, these are the buckets that I personally use as a bit of a guideline to help me not run out of time in the exam. So when we have the case study right at the beginning here, you're going to start the exam and you're going to get dropped straight into a case study. And you'll know that because you say, oh, this is the case study. We know that it's going to be eight to 10 questions. Now, what I personally do is a lot about 30 minutes for that case study, because there's quite a lot of reading to do and like understanding of the case study and how it works. So I recommend about 30 minutes setting aside. Okay. So you get the timer starting and in your head, you're thinking, okay, by the time 30 minutes comes, I want to be finished this case study, preferably earlier, right? If you can bank some time, then that's good. That breaks down as roughly two minutes per question. Okay, so in your head, you're giving yourself two minutes to answer each question. At the end, you will then have about 10 minutes to review so that after the 30 minutes, hopefully you've got a really good start under your belt and you've answered these questions very well. Now, normally you can't go back, right? So once you finish the case study, I'll say, okay, the case study is finished and then you'll have to accept that and then move forward and you can't go back after that. Then you'll be entering the, what I would call general questions section. So the remainder of your questions and the remainder of your time will be kind of like general questions that don't relate to each other can come from any part of the exam study guide. So you're gonna have roughly 45 questions. And for this, the guide that I use in my head is one minute per question, okay? So that's quite fast. So you have to be reading the question and all of the answers very quickly, and you're not wasting too much time thinking about things, okay? We'll talk about how we approach generally each question a little bit later on, but in general, what I do is I read through the question. If I know it, I answer it. If I don't know it, I'll guess and flag it for review. We'll talk about that 
in a little bit more detail in a minute. Because what you want to be doing is going through the questions at least once, right? You want to get here and have done all 45 questions or at least seen all 45 questions and answered or guessed 45 questions, preferably within 45 minutes, right? Because then you're giving yourself a bit of a buffer at the end to go back and review the questions that you're not sure about. Then you can use Microsoft Learn, okay? I would argue that you shouldn't be using Learn in the first pass when you're going through all of the questions for the first time, but you should be using it in this review period that, you, that you've given yourself, right? I just wanna make it clear that these review periods are not given to you in the exam. You have to make time for these yourself, right? These are conceptual review periods. So that was if the case study is at the start of the exam. Now, if the case study is at the end of the exam, you need to be even tighter with your time management planning, right? Because it's gonna look a bit, little bit like this. So if you start your exam and it doesn't mention anything about a case study, you just get launched straight into the general questions section, then you know that, okay, I've got a case study coming up at the end of my exam, which means that you need to get through 45 questions-ish in the first 70 minutes. And you need to be more disciplined with your time here because you don't want to run out of time for your case study questions. And you'll get this can't go back thing, right? So you'll need to get to this point as quickly as possible then you won't be able to go back and then you'll have the case study questions for the last 30 minutes. So this is like the, the reverse of what we just saw. Your fast and furious period will be at the start. So you have 45 questions, one minute per question. Don't use learn until you've gone all the way through. I try and get through as quickly as possible. Only when I've got through all, all of these questions, 45-ish questions, then I look at Microsoft Learn and just validate some of my questions that I'm not sure about, or I look up things that, you know, syntax perhaps that, you know, you know it exists in Learn, but you don't want to look at it when you're going through this section, but you can look it up in this review period. So it's essential you get through these questions with enough time to do the case study at the end, right? So roughly 70 minutes or 30 minutes to go, you need to leave yourself to then tackle the case study at the end. As I mentioned, some general advice for each question, read through each question and all of the answers. If you're confident about the answer, then just answer it and click next, right? If you're more than 90% sure, 95% sure, answer it, click next. Now, if you're unsure about the answer, the first time you read through it, then you need to guess the answer and mark it for review. That's what I do. It's important that you guess it because you might not have time to come back to this question. So it's better to guess it than to leave it blank because you know a blank answer is never gonna be right, but at least a guess you have a chance and you don't get negatively marked for answers that are wrong, right? So you might as well guess. As I mentioned, don't spend more than one minute trying to answer or think about any of the questions, at least in that general period, okay? Don't spend five minutes looking out the window trying to remember some specific syntax. It's just not worth it, right? You might as well, if you're not sure, guess it, mark it for review, come back to it at the end. I would argue to not look it up in the documentation at this stage, you know, in that general stage. So let's talk about after the exam. So you will know if you pass or fail directly after the exam. If you fail, then don't be too hard on yourself. This is a tough exam, the DP700, and it does require a fairly deep level of practical knowledge. When you finish the exam, you'll get given a breakdown of which sections you scored less than 70% on. So 700 out of 1,000 is the pass mark scaled score. You know, it's not quite 70%, but it's on that ballpark figure. So you'll see which sections you did well on and which ones you did less well on, right? That you need to improve on in the future. If you pass, congratulations. You can definitely be proud of this achievement. It's definitely a good exam to have under your belt. Make sure you to share it with your network. And if you found this series helpful in your preparation, feel free to tag me on LinkedIn or anything like that. It really helps the channel grow. Then you will have probably, you don't want to think about this right now, but in 12 months, you'll be required to recertify, right? So there's a shorter version of the exam, which is free, just to kind of check that you haven't forgotten everything and you're kind of keeping up to date with the changes in the Fabric platform over that 12 month period. Good luck to everyone. Thank you very much for following along with this series and all the best for the exam. Thank you very much.